have your Bibles, go ahead and open to John chapter 3. And it reads, Now a certain man, a Pharisee called Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jew Jewish ruling council, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus replied, I tell you the solemn truth, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? Jesus answered, I tell you the solemn truth, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. For what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed, I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows wherever it will, and you hear the sound it makes, but you do not, where it do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. <clears throat> Nicodemus replied, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't know these things? I tell you the solemn truth, we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Remember I said that John's gospel was so very different from the others? John isn't concerned so much about the apocalypse or about what the scriptures say. He's concerned with the mystery of where Jesus came from and where the church is going. John was very much a mystic, and his gospel revels in mysteries. He talks about the spirit, the things that are unseen, but that isn't the same as unknowable. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. You see, Nicodemus has come to Jesus at night. He doesn't want other people to know that he's going to talk to Jesus. So he comes in the middle of the night and he asks his questions because he knows Jesus' answers are going to be scandalous. Jesus replies to him with a mystery. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the spirit is spirit. You see, each and every one of us is born of the flesh. In just the way that Nicodemus says, we are born in a very earthly way, and flesh is flesh. But when God called us, he awakened within us our spirits. And so what is born in that moment is a spirit. And by living in the way of Christ, we continually nurture that spirit. That spirit that is waiting to be born in a world that is currently invisible to us. Just as Jesus said, it is like the wind. You hear the sound that it makes, but you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. We don't know from where God has called us. All we know is that he has. We don't know to where we're going. The Bible is very, very vague on the details about heaven. We don't know where we come from or where we're going. In Hebrew, by the way, wind and spirit are the same word. They are both ruach. They are both breath. And the breath within us is the spirit of God. Just as it says in Genesis that God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living being. And so it is that we receive our spirit. 
Now, Nicodemus doesn't understand this because you cannot be born again in the way that he understands it. Jesus replies to him, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Think about that for a moment. When the people of Israel in the wilderness sinned and turned away from God, they were attacked by snakes. And God told Moses, put the image of a snake around your staff and raise it up and call out to the people of Israel. And everyone that looks at that staff will live. And this is what Jesus is saying. Look to the cross. Look to the cross and live. But not just live live life abundantly, live eternally. That eternal life isn't something we're waiting for in the hereafter. It's something that we started a long time ago. It's something that if it hasn't started, can start today. He continues, for in this way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Isn't that interesting? The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe in him has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now this is the basis for judging, that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil deeds hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that it may be plainly evident that his deeds have been done in God. I've heard many debates as to where salvation starts. Does it start with belief? Does it start with baptism? Does it start when we simply look to Jesus? Or do we even need to look to Jesus? Did it start at Calvary? The Christian Universalist would say all that was required was Christ's death. He died for everyone, and it doesn't matter what you do. But we see here that he tells us, look to the cross. Look up. We see that he refers to baptism and being born of the water and of the Spirit. But moreover, there's a thread that runs through the whole thing. And that is that we are looking not to ourselves, not to our works, not to any law that we can abide by, but we are looking to the one who sent Christ to us. That we are living in his light and that we live honest lives. Always trying to be more like Jesus, always trying to be more like the one who sent him and to grow closer to him. If we do this, we have life. Not that life is coming, we have it now and we will have it eternally. After this, Jesus said, Jesus and his disciples came into Judean territory and there he spent time with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Anon near Selim because water was plentiful there. What does that tell you, by the way, that water was plentiful there? It tells you this was the dry season. Otherwise, water would be plentiful everywhere. And people were coming to him and being baptized. 
for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now a dispute came about between some of John's disciples and a certain person concerning ceremonial washing. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan River, about whom you testified, see, he is baptizing, and everyone is flocking to him. John replied, no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but rather I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This then is my joy and it is complete. He must become more important while I become less. This is what it means to be a Christian, by the way. Because, as John says, no one can receive anything except that it has been sent from above. You see, one of the things that I researched before I decided to plant a church was, what's the right way to baptize someone? It's a good question. Every church does it differently, after all. So there must be reasons, right? Well, there are reasons. Mostly they're silly. Mostly they come from different readings of the same book, and they're all very well justifiable. But what John is saying here is no one can baptize unless their credentials are from, from above. In other words, it doesn't come from this seminary or that seminary. It doesn't come from holding this set of beliefs or that set of beliefs comes from believing that Jesus is the Son of God. And if that's your starting point, then you're baptizing people correctly. And for the right reasons. John knows that his credentials stem not from having the right education, not from being of the right lineage, not from any earthly thing but rather that he is the one that God sent to do the job. Those are his credentials. And people see that and they say, oh, you must be the Christ, the one we've been waiting for. No, I'm just here to do a job. <sighs> he says, the one who comes from above is superior to all. The one who is from the earth, belongs to the earth, and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is superior to all. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Why don't they accept it? The one who's above. Uh, because they haven't seen and heard anything like it. He comes from above, and so does his testimony. And just like Jesus said to Nicodemus, we testify about what we have seen and heard. So when John comes and testifies about the things that are earthly, people understand. They say, oh my goodness, this man was sent from God. He's clearly the Messiah. But when Jesus comes and testifies about things that are heavenly, no one understands what he's talking about. His perspective is not theirs. The one who has accepted his testimony has confirmed clearly that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God. For he does not give the Spirit sparingly. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things under his authority. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. The one who rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. Here we see that people accept John because what he speaks is earthly, but people only accept Jesus because they themselves have been called by God. No one can understand what Jesus has said. No one can understand the gospel or the message within it unless God has already called them because the gospel comes from heaven and nothing in this world, 
looks like the gospel. Nothing in this world looks like love your neighbor as yourself. Nothing looks like give everything you have to the poor and come follow me. Nothing looks like that. We live in a world in which we place ourselves first, in which we have to do everything to survive. We must be selfish just to survive. But that isn't the world God has called us to, and we know it. And because we know it, we have been called by God. That's the only reason we can recognize the gospel. The gospel of John is difficult to read. It's difficult because it means putting our faith in God alone, that God calls us, God sanctifies us, God redeems us. It means that I can talk all day, but I can never change your minds unless God has already started that work. I was thinking about a question all week this week, and that was, if Jesus knew how his words would be used in the future. Do you think he'd change them? Do you think if he knew that people would start crusades in his name, would start wars in his name, would justify hate, would justify bigotry in his name, do you think he would have changed his words? I don't think Jesus would have changed the words that forgave the woman caught in adultery. I don't think he would change the words that say, love your neighbor as yourself, or love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with every breath. I don't think he would change the words. To forgive, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, as many times as it takes. In fact, I don't think he would change one word of love and forgiveness and hope and virtue. The problem isn't what Jesus said, but just like what we've been studying in Genesis, it's that every evil comes from within. The problem isn't the words Jesus spoke, is that we don't read them enough. What is flesh is flesh. And for so many centuries, the church, every church, has been flesh. It has been dedicated to the law and the ways of the flesh. And if we're going to survive, if we're going to see eternity, we have to devote ourselves to the way of the Spirit, to the way of Jesus, to love and hope and peace and truth. Because if we devote ourselves to such things, only then will we be born again of the Spirit into eternal life. Amen?